I mean, I don't want to hear them throwing up here. Oh, come on. That's just, no, that's that's just kind of a paltry off. excuse. All right. <laughs> so, so I am going to record this. We have a couple other people who haven't made it yet. But today, we want to go on. We looked at chapters 13, 14, and today we're going to look at chapter 18. And those three really talk about informal ways of reasoning poorly. These are informal fallacies. They don't fit the pattern of uh, what's an what's an fallacious reasoning uh, for a hypothetical or fallacious reasoning for a categorical syllogism. Go back and look at those at your notes and look at Herrick and look at the PowerPoint for formal reasoning because that is on the next quiz, which opens today. Then on Monday we're going to do the student evals and we will do um, we'll also do bias which is not in in Herrick at all so it's chapters 11 um, 12 13 14 and 18 so lots of chapters if it opens today what day is it, or yeah, what, when does it, it close I don't know okay. so 11 we'll look at it before before we go 11 I promise. through 14 is on the quiz 11 through 14 and 18 11 through 14 and 18. And there are three sets of PowerPoints. There's, there's one for, for logic, one for uh, 13, 14, and then one that we'll look at today for chapter 18. So once again, informal fallacies. Informal fallacies, <coughs> such as post hoc. This is one of, the, one of the common ones. Something follows after, therefore something is caused by. That's the way people will reason. Uh, this is fallacious. One of the most common, post hoc, ergo propter hoc, means there, after this, therefore because of this. One of the most common post hoc arguments is about drug usage. Right? You've probably all heard a certain drug being called a gateway drug. And the reasoning is most heroin users began using marijuana. Therefore, marijuana use leads to heroin use. You'll hear that kind of, of rationale advanced. Regardless of whether marijuana use is bad or, or has some medical use, most you want to ban marijuana because it leads to heroin. The problem, of course, is that most heroin users also drink milk. Should we say that milk is a gateway drug to heroin? Well, of course we wouldn't say that. We wouldn't say that. And we wouldn't consider milk a drug. Many heroin users also used alcohol prior to using heroin. Would we say that alcohol is a gateway drug to heroin? No, we wouldn't say that. Most heroin users also smoked. Would we say tobacco is a gateway drug to heroin? Of course, we wouldn't say that. We wouldn't say that. Just because something follows after does not mean it is caused by. It is, uh, it's also just because two things occur at the same time doesn't mean that one causes the other. There is simply correlation. Herrick talks about fallacies of faulty assumption in chapter 18. Fallacies of faulty assumption. One of the, one of the first he talks about is the fallacy called, that's called ad ignorantum, arguing from our ignorance. Let me get to there. He has some examples of each of these. Because there is no hard evidence that violence on television program has an undesirable effect on children, we must conclude that it has no effect. That's a, an argument from ignorance. We don't know, therefore we, we will prove. We will say it must be. We don't know whether Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, therefore he must. We'll just go ahead and say. And, and indeed we did that even though there was lots of evidence that he didn't, 
that he had had those, but they were destroyed. There was evidence we had, and I'm bringing this up because we keep hearing about there was faulty, faulty uh, intel that led us into Iraq. Well, we had good intel. We simply chose to ignore it. We had a, a, a weapons inspector, a UN weapons inspector in Iraq, and he was gaining access to all those places that we said there must be weapons, found none, and we said, well, he's being tricked. We ignored it. We had good intel, but we ignored it. We reach a conclusion on the basis of a lack of evidence. Ad ignorantum does not mean you're, that your audience is ignorant. It means that you don't have evidence, but you still draw a conclusion. Because the evidence isn't there, it must be the case. No one has ever proven that there isn't Bigfoot, so there must be one. Which is the, the argument of, uh, what is it, Searching for Bigfoot, or whatever that TV show is, with, with the uh, Bigfoot research group, or whatever those idiots are, those four people that just, the guy who is the Sasquatch expert is the most annoying person on television. I mentioned this, well, I mentioned this one when we looked at chapters 13, 14, but I want to mention it again because it, it is widely misused, and it is an important one, uh, begging the question. Peticcio Principi. And Petio Principi, Peticcio or Petio Principi, is uh, making a circular argument. It is not begging that the question be asked. It often gets used that way in contemporary discourse, and I wish it wouldn't because begging the question is a perfectly good expression to describe what in fact is a logical fallacy, not, that, not an insistence that we ask these questions. It is, it is a presumption in the question of the answer. So that, for example, um, Herrick has, let's see what he has. Um, thank you for your patience. A couple of minutes after a bank I had called put me on hold, recorded voice said, thank you for your patience, your call will be answered momentarily. The recorded voice assumed that I was being patient. Similarly, a candidate who says to her audience, do we want four more years of liberal leadership in Washington, is expecting a negative response. The question is, the question implies the answer. Of course you'd like that. That's the kind of thing a person like you would like. Is both ad hominem, by implication, and a, quest a begging of the question. We talked briefly, I talked about ad hominem two days ago. Uh, ad hominem is anything that is against the person. What would you expect from Hillary Clinton? It was, a, it was surprising to me back in 2004 just how much resentment and spite there was over Hillary Clinton's candidacy. Or 2008, thank you, Jeremy. I, I, it's the drugs, it's the drugs, that's what it is. How much resentment there was over her candidacy. It was, it was irrational. And then, of course, we elected Barack Obama, and that's even more irrational. But, but uh, what would you expect from a Hillary supporter? Or, you priests are all like that. Whatever that was, you know, it's that, it's against the person. There is nothing, there is nothing about it that actually rises to the level of argument. There is, of course, and I call it ad hominem circumstantial. Herrick calls it ad hominem accidental. Both of them are the same, mean the same thing, so you may call it either circumstantial or accidental. And it's also called poisoning the well. How would you know how to raise children? You're just a spinster. Well, of course we'd expect an argument like that from you as a member of a tribe that sponsors gambling. Okay. 
Ad hominems can also be called tu quoque. Tu quoque. Uh, it comes from the Latin meaning and you too. And you too. Um, or you also. You turn to somebody who's always talking during the movie and you say, you always talk during the movie. I wish you'd shut up. You always talk during the movie. And they respond, so. you do too. You do too. So, you do too. That's too quoque. Right? Or, how can you tell me to study harder and apply myself at college? You weren't a standout student. You spent more time golfing than studying. Or, in the case of most of your parents, how can you tell me to lay off the drugs? When you were my age, I know you smoked dope. In the case of most of your parents, if they are my age or within 20 years of my age, yes, they did. <laughs> I don't even know your parents, and I'll bet I'm right. Well, you do too. <laughs> Another appeal that is, strictly speaking, ad hominem is the appeal ad populum. It is an appeal to the people. All right. So that we see this in the political arena, right now it's going on. The president has decided that one way to, to get the Congress to cooperate is to force them by getting people to, to push the agenda that he's got. That is, in this case, raising taxes on income over $250,000 leaving the tax cuts in place, leaving the tax structure in place for $250,000 and below. And he's going out to the people and he's appealing to them and saying, contact your congressman. Let them know where you stand. Let them know we want a balanced approach. Is that the best thing to do? Is a balanced approach the best way to solve the problem? Well, that argument is not being made. What is being made is, Everybody wants a balanced approach. 60% of the American public want a balanced approach to solving the problem. Is that, a good, is that a good argument? Well, no, it's a good political argument. It's a good political argument. But in terms of logic, it's not, it is a fallacy to think just because everybody wants it, it must be the case. 50,000 Elvis fans can't be wrong. In fact, that was the title of one of Elvis's late albums. 50,000 Elvis fans cannot, can't be wrong. Well, yes, they can. In addition, then, in addition to the ad hominem fallacies, Herrick, Herrick then talks about case presentation fallacies. The very first one is the straw man. We see this quite frequently in all kinds of arguments. And many of you used straw man fallacies. You presented a case, for example, when you had the broadest interpretation of our parliamentary, uh, um, our parliamentary resolution. This house is the leadership of the Christian church. Holy smokes. You implied a straw man. That is, you implied that there was someone who was saying the Christian tradition is not adequate for support of sustainability. That there was someone who was saying that. And then Keenan came along and he proved that indeed evangelical, evangelical preaching and teaching these days is throw away the earth, it doesn't matter, God's going to get rid of it anyway. And that is a, that is a position, but there was this kind of implied straw man and we'll frequently put up a straw man in an argument. The straw man are, uh, it's, it's the, um, first of all, you're contending, everybody on my, all of my opponents believe X. We heard some of this yesterday in our, in our debate about feminism, in which I heard, my mother doesn't want a woman firefighter to drag her out of the house. She wants a man who can carry her. Well, 
that makes all kinds of assumptions about female firefighters. Makes all kinds of assumptions about it, and it assumes the worst. That is, that a female firefighter will be physically weaker than her male uh, compatriot, and yet will be assigned to do things that physically are impossible for her to do. Do you know of any phys any? Do you know any firefighters? Have you looked at the issue of firefighters and women in firefighting? No. Instead, what we do is we set up a worst case scenario that probably doesn't even exist, or at least we don't know if it exists. And we presume that that exists, and we say, well, because of that, therefore, we can't be for this. That is a straw man. It's something that can easily be knocked over. We have no evidence or no specifics. And if you read the dialogues of Plato, you'll find that often this is Socrates' method. Socrates never loses an argument. And it's largely because he sets up a straw man. The opponent's position is then, is then made into something that it really isn't, without nuance and without subtlety, so that Socrates may knock it over. The straw man fallacy is on its face just fallacious. It, it is not good reasoning. Okay? We also have then what Herrick calls majoring in minors, or others call the red herring. Any fans of, mis of murder mysteries? We only have one, two. You'll notice that uh, whenever you read a mystery, you'll have some clue that gets thrown in. It can't be so obvious that you would dismiss it. But it's just, it's a little clue that will lead you down the wrong path if you follow it. And good mystery writers will deliberately put that in so that when you follow it, you're led to the wrong conclusion. And when you get to the right conclusion, you will do what the mystery writer wants you to do, which is go, God, that's so much smarter than I am. You want the mystery writer to be smarter than you. If you figure it out, like with, within very few pages of the murder, the book loses interest. So the murder, the, the mystery writer will throw in, uh, will throw in a uh, something that uh, will lead you in the wrong place, and uh, that is called a red herring. It's also something used in argumentation. Um, for example, uh, you call attention on something minor uh, and inconsequential. I'm not sure what the red light, I don't even remember what red light, green light means. I don't have my notes in front of me, so let me, let me walk over here and see if I can jog my memory on the red light, green light. But arguing... I still don't know what red light, green light, what I meant by that. But arguing, for example, in the political campaign, that Romney couldn't possibly understand middle class people because he was so rich, is majoring in a minor. His personal wealth is inconsequential to his ability to empathize. If he is unable to empathize with the ordinary people, it's not because he's rich, it's because he's unable to empathize with ordinary people. And it may even be that empathy is, is a red herring in and of itself, although I think not. Uh, in the previous campaign, in the campaign in 2008, we had people bringing up Sarah Palin's wardrobe. And Sarah Palin received a large uh, um, allowance for a uh, new wardrobe from the Republican National Committee. And uh, there was, at, toward the end of the campaign, people were calling into question whether she would return that wardrobe or keep it. And it was a, it was a really substantial uh, wardrobe allowance. That's really majoring in minors. That's a red herring. That has nothing to do with whether Sarah Palin was uh, was adequate 
to be the Vice President of the United States. Um, or, for example, where, uh, where the, the right made an issue out of Pastor Jeremiah Wright, and really a very small portion of his preaching in Chicago. There, was, there were like a half dozen words that were just ripped out of context, and, and Wright was condemned. And we even saw Obama, because it became politically so, so strong, such a strong point, uh, we even saw Obama having to distance himself from Jeremiah Wright. Um, this was a red herring. Had nothing to do with Obama's policies, or with his, his thought, or with where he wanted to take the country. It was simply some, a very small bit of Wright's sermonizing in which he talked about the hypocrisy of the country and the, and the hypocrisy of our war policy. And, and really opened that up to question, from a Christian standpoint, can God bless something that has this kind of hypocrisy at its, uh, at its uh, core? Uh, the old enough to smoke, sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll use that. Um, of course I can, I can do this because I'm old enough to. I'm old enough to drink, I'm old enough to vote, I'm old enough to smoke. So I ought to be able to make this kind of a decision. You should listen to me because of my age. Fallacies of Kate's presentation also include under description. Under description, Herrick dis de descri uh, des describes as simply the fallacy of uh, creating a false sense of meaning by not describing the whole thing. This is just a case of. Oh, it's just a case of. And you fill in whatever it is. You, you delegitimate your opponent's point of view by saying, well, it's just a case of. You under-describe and analogize. Or, the opposition has really only presented one fact. Regardless of what the case may be that they've presented, the opposition has really only presented one fact, and one fact only, and that is, and then state it as boldly and as simply as you possibly can, under description. It is rhetorically very powerful, very powerful. If you want to win an argument rhetorically, if you want to get people on your side, this is one of the tools that you can use but it is not an argument with the idea, rather it is simply an argument um, with, as with a straw man, with what the oppo your opponent doesn't really represent. Fallacies, then he goes on to fallacies of suggestion. And here we have some, uh, some fallacies that have fine names. Paralepsis which is the art of making a claim by not making a claim. My opponent has spent millions on his, on his uh, houseboat and nothing on charity. But that's the kind of, of low blow he would raise and therefore I won't. I won't make an issue, we saw this we saw this here in, in Lindsborg about 10 years ago. I won't make an issue of the fact that the current mayor went to Sweden on the city's dime. Uh, but I'm not going to make an issue of that. Yeah. Okay? Selection. Selection is to, pre to present an interpretation that... Uh, that presents just some of the information and suppresses other, other parts of the claim. Um, we don't make the case fully. Um, we, we have more than one thing. So, for example, um, the example that Herrick gives, anyone who wonders whether Representative Clark can identify with the middle income taxpayer should compare her income to her taxes. Last year she made, only 80, made over $85,000 but paid only $5,000, $85,000, but paid only $5,000 in taxes. Mitt Romney made over $21 million, but paid only 15% in taxes. 
Okay? So that's, that's only part of the information. Some get suppressed. Because Mitt Romney, while he only paid 15%, it was what the government wanted him to pay, and a little bit less, because all of his income came from capital gains. The problem wasn't Romney, it was the system. Okay, that's arrangement. We group or order or associate to suggest connection where none exists. Arrangement, uh, Herrick's example. The Committee on Human Relations has, they tell us, important work to do. I doubt it. Listen to the three items on the agenda for the last meeting. One, student relations at Jackson High. Two, the language in the city's hiring policy. And three, a new name for the mascot of Westland Junior High School. How are these important issues? They're trivial. Right? So we arrange those as if, they, as, as if these are very small things, when in fact they're at the very heart of what we mean by human relations in a complex society. We can also make fallacious appeals. We can appeal to pity. Right? These are not necessarily fallacious. Rhetorically, they can be quite strong. But the appeal to pity is not a logical appeal. It's not a logical appeal. You've got to forgive me for forgetting stuff because the drugs, the chemo drugs have still got my mind in a fog and I don't always remember things. I can't find my textbook for this class. I don't know what I've done with it. I don't know where it is. I cannot think of what I've done with it. This is all true, by the way. And it's all because, it's all because of the chemo drugs. Right? It's an appeal to pity. Now, you might be willing to give me, to cut me that slap because you are nice people. You might do that, and I would appreciate that. But logically, there's no reason just because I, I'm forgetful that doesn't make an argument for me. It makes, it makes you pity me. Ad baculum, appeal to force. Do it or else. What should we do about Iraq? And Coulter once suggested we should invade Nuke them, convert all their leaders to Christianity, or kill them. <laughs> now, Ann Coulter, being Ann Coulter, A, is not terribly thoughtful, and B, is a provocateur, and was looking to provoke. But that's an appeal to force. That's an appeal to force. We see the same thing going on in, in the uh, relationship between Israel and the Gaza Strip. Um, where we have an appeal to force on both sides. Give us what we want or we'll, or we'll send rockets into Tel Aviv. Give us what we want or we will send tanks into Gaza. An appeal to force. Appeal to authority. You should do this because after all I am the teacher. I am the expert. This is why you should do it. Now, sometimes appeals to authority are absolutely necessary and absolutely good. As, for example, when I am assigning grades, I am the authority. Hey, hey! Look how happy he is. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Although, if I set out a standard and I, and I keep to the standard, then we both know where that's coming from. And the question that you should be raising is the question of the standard. Was the standard fair? Was the standard just? But for me to simply say, as many, as many faculty will say, this is my job. No, you earned this grade. Well, that's, that's sort of true, but not quite. You will hear that from several faculty on this campus. I don't, I don't give grades. People earn them. Yeah. Coaches will use an appeal to authority all the time. Mm -hmm. That is the primary appeal that coaches make. They don't have to, but they do. There are other ways to get what you want. But just because you're the coach doesn't mean you're right. 
just because you're the faculty member doesn't mean you're correct. The appeal to authority is not a necessarily logical nor a necessarily fallacious appeal. If the building is burning, there is no need to debate. Only need to get out. In all other circumstances, debate is welcome. The reduction to absurdity I talked about uh, uh, I talked about a little bit last time, uh, but it is simply to to make your opponent's position look just silly. It's just silly to believe this. Let's see what he has as his example of reductio ad absurdum. Uh, In this body, the Senate, we begin our work day with the comfort and stimulus of a voluntary group prayer. Recently, such a practice has been constitutionally blessed by the Supreme Court. It is patently absurd in my judgment that the opportunity for the same beneficial experience is denied to the boys and girls who attend public schools. This was Strom Thurmond's uh, reasoning on prayer in public schools. Okay. It's absurd that what we get to do in the United States Senate is denied to boys and girls in the public schools. Sounds good, but it is simply a reductio ad absurdum because there are all kinds of things that are different about being in the U.S. Senate and being in a public school classroom. And by the way, uh, I would make an appeal to pity or an appeal to emotion to point out to you I went to public schools for the first 12 years of my life and never once in those 12 years prayed and I did manage to come out of that as a moral and normal human being, more or less. <laughs> That's kind of a fallacy too, though. What? That I came out of it as a moral and normal human being? <laughs> no. Well, Go ahead. Why? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure out which one. I mean... You're using, you're using one example. I'm using, it's a hasty generalization. Yeah. But so is the other. So yeah, is the other. No, I would agree. I would agree. So is the other. Uh, but <laughs> but I'm, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, I am offended by all of this talk about how the omission of prayer in public schools has created a terrible society. Because mm -hmm. I am not terrible. You're saying, you are implying that I should be a terrible, that I am a terrible human being, and I'm not. I did mention this last time, Eric, Herrick uh, includes this in, in his chapter on evidence, and that's the hasty generalization. It is not truly an informal fallacy, but it is like an informal fallacy. And that means that you have too few examples, too few examples that are not representative, and an empirical assertion is made without adequate empirical data. Uh, it is often used in uh, philosophical or in uh, academic or in other sorts of reporting. Uh, the American people, and you hear this a lot from both sides on the political spectrum, the American people will not accept. The American people want. Well, it's never clear what the people want. It's not even clear who the people are. Uh, did they vote for uh, President Obama mean that the majority of the populace supported all of his policies? No. Did it mean they supported some? Yeah. Which ones? Yeah, it sure does. Because both sides are arguing the American people will never stand for. And that neither of them have, have the case. The media is often used as a, uh, a hasty generalization. The media, as if there were only one, and as if they, they operated univocally. Studies have shown, whenever you hear studies have shown, watch your wallet. Okay? Studies have shown is a way of, uh, of uh, uh, equivocating and a way of making a hasty generalization. Any questions about these? All right, get out your Herrick, turn to the exercises in chapter 18. Let's see what we can do.
Uh, I'm going to work from the chapter 18 of the of the third edition. So they may not be numbered quite the same for you if you have four. If you've got three, you'll have the same number as I do. If you've got four, you may have to look. Hmm? All right, here. I got, I'll share this one. I'll share this one. All right, number one. Page 137 in, in three. You got a book? No. Okay, so Stephen, get close enough so that you read over your shoulder. All right. Share as many as you can. Get it out. We'll read the, we'll read the exercise and then we'll see if we can, we can locate it with one of the... Okay? I think it's, it may not be 137. Chapter 18. Yeah, 244. 244. I'm looking at a different text. 244, guys. 244. Yep. Yeah. All right. So the very first one. 